Right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this morning, which is an introduction to hair removal with laser and IPL. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Kerry Belber from Laser Skin Solutions and Tejinder from the fantastic Ted and Co. And um, welcome to you both to our webinar this morning. You both got an abundance of experience in hair removal. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with you and getting into the, the ins and outs of everything to do with laser and IPL and hair removal. How are you both this morning? Both doing okay? Yeah, good, thank you. Good, thank it's, you. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous here in Bournemouth today. Oh, is it? So, yeah, the weather's really nice. Yeah, we're very lucky. Oh, very nice. Just happy um, that lockdown hasn't been in November. It would have been awful. I know, and we've been so lucky with it. I'm quite far up north near Blackpool and we've had beautiful weather as well, so. Silver lining. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, I'll just run through, uh, I guess, the, 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 the subjects matter that we're going to cover today. So, um, and feel free to um, chat away in the chat box off to the side. Um, all the presenters are able to see the chat. Um, so just click on where you see at the bottom the little chat box there and you'll be able to interact with us as we go through. We would like to make it as interactive as possible today. So ask as many questions as you like as we go through. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, this is an introduction to hair removal. Okay, the subject of hair removal is vast. And we could easily spend several days talking about everything to do with laser hair removal. So the focus really of this morning is to do an overview. We're going to cover how do light technologies actually remove the hair? So go into the physics of it, into the, um, the mechanism within the skin. And then we're also going to look at the types of laser and IPL for hair removal. So I know some of you in the audience will already be using laser and IPL. Some of you will be considering purchase of laser and IPL devices. So we want to give you a really unbiased view of the different sorts of technologies that are out there. And then we're also going to be really drawing on Kerry and Tedge's experience, um, looking at how they optimize treatments in the real world and get fantastic results on their customers. Now, this is definitely an overview, like I said, because it is quite a meaty topic, laser and IPL hair removal. And so I wanted to just introduce you to a course that we are running next week. And this is a virtual classroom course, so much like the webinar today, but this is actually a hair removal masterclass. So whereas today is an introduction, this one is a full day course and it's a masterclass. It's going to be £75, including the VAT, and I'll send everybody on this webinar an email with details of how to attend that masterclass if you want to. Um, and I know, Kerry, you've done a couple of the masterclasses with us, haven't you? So would you mind telling people what to expect from a day like this? So basically it's it's always interesting because there's always a mix of people who come on the masterclasses. There's, there's often people who've been doing it for years and obviously did their initial Linton training several years beforehand. Uh, but there's also people who have, you know, recently done, you know, their level four, maybe even a year ago, um, and who are just coming back for a refresher. So it's, I think you do a really good job in that it is tailored to kind of every sort of level of experience and it is really in depth um so i you know one of the things i always insist at my clinic i don't care how long anyone's been lasering i always put them through really good qualifications mm -hmm. and i always remind the girl or girls who work for me that you know they are part of an elite group of laser therapists because of the training you know people are only as good as their training mm. so the day is fantastic you come away thinking god i can't believe it i've been lasering for x y and z and years and i've still learned you know something and it just it gives you that understanding to have the confidence to tweak your settings to get the best results because if you understand fundamentally what's happening with the tissue interaction when you're lasering skin even if the target is hair then you can really get the best out of out of your treatment so it definitely gives you the edge and at the end of the day you want people to come in have their course go possibly come back for other stuff but actually say to people you know what i went to wherever laser skin solutions and look you know i've had six treatments and the hair's gone you know you don't want people to be coming back forever uh treating the same area not not getting the results so 
And that's sort of, yeah. I guess, the focus of today is about the training. So obviously we're Linton, we do sell machines, but we're not going to be um, doing a sales pitch today regarding the systems. It's a genuine education training about laser and IPL hair removal. We're going to really look at the, the different types of technology, whether we sell them or not at Linton. And the masterclasses are that as well. So the masterclasses are independent. They're run by our clinical director. She's a PhD physicist, Dr. Sam Hills. And they really do go, go in depth. So it doesn't matter if you use Linton equipment or not. This webinar will be useful, as will the masterclass. Um, and it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for two years or 10 years. We do tend to find that the discussion between operators often educates us as well. You know, because once people are out on the field and they've been using their lasers for 10 plus years, it's when you really, you know, the knowledge that each of our individual practitioners has is a great thing to sort of um, get, get all joined together and brought together in that kind of environment. So, um, OK, that's enough about the mass class next week. Let's crack on with today then. So we're going to be talking today, obviously, about hair removal. And if I could summarise how any laser or IPL hair removal um, system works, it's essentially um, it's selective photothermolysis. OK, so that's the process uh, occurring. But photothermolysis really explains it. Photo is light and thermolysis is heat. OK, so you have a light heat interaction. All lasers and IPLs use light. They're emitted onto the skin. Dark things in the skin absorb that light and it turns from light energy into heat energy and the heat damages the structure that you're trying to destroy. Now, different colored lights will be absorbed by different colored things in the skin. That's why not one laser or IPL suits all. It's why the, there is no real answer to what's the best laser or IPL to use because there's a variety of different things that you need to take into account when you're performing these treatments and we'll go through those and, and through all of this in a bit more detail and Kerry and Ted feel free at any point to jump in um, I know you've probably got great ways of discussing things with your customers um, and you know some good analogies I know we spoke on the phone about your your nice analogies about hair removal Kerry so they might be good to share as well as we go through uh, okay Um, Kerry, are you able to see the chat box actually just um, as I'm talking? Yeah. If there's anything that you think is, is um, relevant to, to interrupt as we're going through, do you want to just okay. nudge sure. me with that? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Super. It's quite difficult to run through your slides and watch the, the chat yeah. at the same time. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So imagine then this red arrow is the light which is being emitted from your laser or IPL. So the hair shaft itself actually acts as the target and it absorbs the energy. So, you know, dark um, black uh, absorbs more than white, absorbs light. That's why if you're wearing a white T-shirt with a dark mark on it, then the dark mark would get hotter than the surrounding white. And it's the same for a dark hair in a white skin. So the actual brown pigment, the melanin within the hair shaft, absorbs the light from the laser and the IPL. And that light energy becomes heat energy and that heat will spread out to the surrounding follicle and it will damage that follicle to prevent hair regrowth. That's a very simple way of looking at how laser or IPL works. But there are some factors which are really, really important, depending on the type of hair you're treating, the type of skin you're treating. And they are pulse duration, wavelength and fluence. OK, so these three factors, pulse duration, wavelength and fluence are the difference between treatment success or failure and so you can really get to understand a lot when you look at the specifications of different machines to see what their parameters are in terms of what flexibility they've got in pulse durations wavelengths and fluence and that can help you to determine the quality of a piece of equipment but in in Generally, the more flexibility you have over these settings, the more accurately you can treat a wide range of skin types and hair types. So you will know yourselves, there are machines out there which you can buy on the internet for £3,000. And there are machines out there you can buy for £70,000, £80,000. OK, what's the difference? Clearly, build quality and reliability is a major factor. 
but also it comes down to the minute details. It comes down to how much can you control that pulse and the fluence and what's the wavelengths that you're working with. And they make a big difference over the actual results that you achieve. So when it comes to what is the best laser or IPL for hair removal, there's a number of different things that you need to take into account. It really depends on your client demographic. So the colours of skin you're treating and we're going to go through which wavelengths are best suited for which colours of skin. How important a factor is speed. OK, so if you're in a business where you are predominantly maybe doing skin treatments and you just want hair as an aside, um, then you might want to go for a device that combines hair with skin rejuvenation and the speed at which that delivers the treatments isn't particularly important. If you are right in the centre of London and you have um, max capacity hair removal going on and you're doing full body laser hair treatment after treatment, the speed at which your device operates is really important. Discomfort during treatment. If you have someone in the local area that's heavily marketing pain free hair removal, that might be a factor you want to consider. Sun exposure. Are you in an area where it's a lot more likely that you'll have tanned skins to treat? System versatility, so what else does that laser do? And of course, budget. So there's, there's a, a huge array of different things. And at, at Linton, we are very, very fortunate in the, the four main types of technology, Alexandrite, ND YAG, IPL, and diode, we sell them all. Why do we sell four different pieces of equipment that do hair removal? Because not one suits all all sorts of different businesses with different demographics, different things on this list, different business goals, different budgets require different pieces of equipment. Now, all of these pieces of equipment get results, but there are slight differences in them that can be customized then to your business and what you're looking for. So we're quite lucky in that we don't, I don't have to be biased today. You know, we're not on this webinar saying, Alexandrite is the best, you must buy an Alexandrite laser. IPL is the best, you must buy IPL. You know, we're in the fortunate position where we understand and build a variety of different technologies and can just consult with you to give you the best idea as to what might be the most appropriate. Um, and as long as you're investing in a good quality piece of equipment, you'll get results. It's about then the extra factors, really, in terms of, um, you know, what you're looking for. And it may be that, that that Kerry and, and Tej, we could chat to you about, you know, why towards the end, why you decided to buy the piece of equipment that you went for in the end. You know, what were the other decisions, um, decision making factors that that you were concerned with when you were investing for your business? I'm just going to say, Haley, quickly that I, mm. you know, I suppose Linton in a way are the same as a laser clinic. You you have your clients, um, and you want to be able to offer. You, you want to be able to offer something to every client and that's the mm. same with laser clinics you you need to be set up ideally so that you, you're not having to turn people away because they're not suitable for your machines so yeah so yeah it is good to have a range depending on you know your area so yeah and unfortunately there's not one device that does everything is there that's um you can just have one thing and that's it nothing else <laughs> to suit every single skin so it is a case of needing to have that flexibility and have that uh, opportunity to switch between different offerings for different people. Yeah. And no one size does suit all for sure. So why is that? Why, why is there a difference? OK, so um, the wavelength is a big factor to consider what type of technology you would like your laser or IPL to be based around. So. When we talk about wavelength, we're talking about the essentially the colour of the light that you apply onto the skin. And that's going to determine how well it's absorbed by different things in the skin. So when you hear the words Alexandrite, Ender Yag, etc., they're referring to the names of different wavelengths. And we measure wavelength in nanometers. So they often have numbers associated with them. So an Alexandrite is a 755 nanometer wavelength. ND YAG is a 1064 nanometer wavelength. IPL is a broadband set of wavelengths. And each of these things is absorbed by that melanin in the hair a little bit differently. 
So what you can see along the bottom here is the different sort of colours of light that you might put on the skin to remove um, hair. And as it goes into that black bit there, that's infrared. So it starts to become invisible. But ruby was one that was originally used, not so much anymore. And we'll talk about why. A very common form of hair removal laser today is alexandrite. Alexandrite actually has a really high absorb, it's really easily absorbed by melanin. So um, you look at this curve, that black line there is demonstrating how well melanin absorbs the different types of light. So you might look at that and think, wow, blue light, you know, let's use a blue light to remove hair because melanin loves that light. It will absorb it really easily. And if you get that absorption really quickly, really easily, then you get loads of heat and you get rid of the hair. Problem is the skin will do that as well. So it's too easily absorbed that the likelihood is you would burn the skin at these higher wavelengths, 300s, 400s, 500s. So you move into a range where you get good melanin absorption for hair removal, but not traumaing the skin. And that's with alexandrite, 755 nanometers. You then also get diodes, usually 808 nanometers, 810 nanometers, and then ND YAGs, 1064 nanometers. So you've got, you know, different wavelengths there. And you can see that the absorption from ND YAG is lower. So melanin doesn't absorb ND YAG that well. OK, that's why it's actually safe to use on a much darker skin type. So skin type four, five, six, six being your Afro-Caribbean black skins. So you've got this this range, Alexandrite, ND Yags, diodes, and um, at the lower end of the spectrum, so 755, you've got higher melanin absorption at the, at the um, ND Yag end of the spectrum, you've got lower melanin absorption. So you often find a lot of devices have both an alexandrite and an ND YAG in it. The alexandrite is fantastic for hair removal on skin types one to three, the lighter coloured skins. And the ND YAG is very, very safe and effective on the darker skins. So the two combined work really well together. Alexandrite is a bit limited. You can't really use an alexandrite typically on your skin types fives and six because melanin absorbs it so well that you have high risk of heating the skin rather than the hair if you start to treat a five and a six. And the ND YAG, because that doesn't absorb the melanin so well, that doesn't really get fantastic results on your skin types one, two, and three, where the hairs have very low melanin content. So a combination of the two works really well. A diode is a good option because a diode sits in the middle doesn't quite have as much melanin absorption as Alex. So it isn't quite as good, as efficient, when it comes to removing hair as an alexandrite. And it isn't quite as safe as an ND YAG, but it's a good all round option in the middle. Sometimes the problem with a diode is you can't get the really short pulses from it that you can with an alexandrite. An alexandrite, is often a laser which you can manipulate to get a really short pulse. And we're gonna come on to pulsing shortly, but it's not just this wavelength that affects your treatment results, it's also the pulse. So you diodes can, are good in the middle. I was gonna say they can be a little bit uncomfortable diodes, can't they? I think as, with anything like your diode and upwards, you're moving into longer wavelengths. Yeah. So they penetrate more deeply into the skin. Alexandrite is quite a superficial uh, light. Um, your diodes and the yags go a bit deeper so the deeper that light is going then the more that you can feel it yeah because um, the heat the heat retains longer in the deeper it goes doesn't it it would do it would and you think your pain receptors are just more you know yeah. you'll, you'll pick it up more the deeper that that heating of the follicle is is happening yeah. but that can be good then for very deep rooted hairs so if you have a really deep you know, bikini hair, or sometimes you get them on the chin, don't you, where they're very, very deep in a darker skin, then the ND YAG can be fantastic for that. 
and men's back sometimes as well yeah. um my partner's a total wimp he's an ideal candidate for laser and he could have it for free but he doesn't <laughs> and i remember having to wax his back and the depths of the follicles were just mm. incredible so the yag would be amazing for something like that mm. so you can get cryo coolers now so cooling cooling tips you know on lasers you can get um cold air coolers that blow cold air at the skin just to make it a lot more comfortable yeah is that a, a good overview for there any questions at this point from the audience on that not on this there's just a question on the level four and master class do you want to cover that later yeah, or we'll come, we'll come back to yeah. that yeah for, the, for those that are interested in doing more then i'm happy to spend a, um, some time at the end just just going through the options in a bit more detail okay so um, I've covered some of this already, but I think it's good to do it whilst you're visually looking at that slide. I think it it, it helps. Um, but this is just now a further breakdown of the different lasers for hair removal. So lasers have been used for hair removal for a really long time. They all use a, a photothermal effect, so they're all working by heating. So they do need to be what we call long pulsed lasers, even though those pulses are actually thousandths of a second long, milliseconds, um, they're still in the laser world termed long pulsed lasers. So the rubies, um, they were the very first one, like I mentioned, the rubies, um, just a bit too aggressive. So, so the melanin really absorbs the ruby light very well, but there was a fairly high risk of side effects with them um, because the, the melanin in the skin would also really absorb the light and that would cause some adverse reactions. So it's not very common to use a, a ruby now, although there are some still in operation and they can be good in the right hands with the right protocols. Alexandrite is considered by many people to be the gold standard for hair removal. This is because it's got a really great wavelength. Hairs really like Alexandrite. So when you've got a hair that's quite um, thin, that's quite pale, it doesn't have a lot of melanin in it, then alexandrite is a great wavelength to use because you don't need a lot of alex to get a result. You know, you can, you can get a really nice absorption um, on a, a typically what we would call a difficult hair. So that is um, a good option. The diode, like I said, for your skin types one to five, although when you're on your skin types one and two, if you're dealing with hairs that are thinner, and finer because you can't always get the really short pulses from a diode then they might not be as effective as an alex for example but a and good also, like all-round option tina's just saying here that i have a diode and find it really sensitive on the face even with the ice cool tip hmm. so this is the thing i mean my from my knowledge diodes can be very uncomfortable anyway and i think the face is very sensitive so mm -hmm. um but yeah are you get actually getting uh, good results with it tina perhaps you could let us know yeah so we've been selling a diet for over 18 months now i think and nice results yeah to, to be honest with you it's like that we get asked this all the time well we get people say all the time i've had ipl hair removal it didn't work i didn't get results i've had alexandrite hair removal i didn't get results i've had this i didn't get results okay it's it's not always about the wavelength if you invest in a really fantastic ipl you will get results if you invest in a really good quality diode you'll get results okay so so you will get results from a good quality piece of equipment it's just there are pieces of equipment out there which aren't as high quality and so it comes down really to a, a lot of it is training you know, a lot of it, you, you can put the best laser in the world in the hands of someone that hasn't been through thorough training about pulses and wavelengths, etc. And they won't get the best out of that piece of equipment. So um, I completely agree with that. I so quite often when I'm interviewing, um, it's not a trick question. It is literally it gives me a really good idea as to how much someone knows about, you know, they could have been doing laser hair removal for years. And, you know, I often say to them, so if you were struggling and if you if you kind of hit a plateau and you weren't getting results, what could you do um, to, you know, to tweak? Well, I would just increase the energy. Okay, well, what if you couldn't increase the fluence? What could you do then? And if they're not coming back to me with, well, I could adjust the pulses and the delays, then it, sh it kind of gives me an idea of, you know, where their gaps in knowledge would need to be filled and how much they know. So if people are not 
knowing or maybe not allowed you know some large laser chains they they invest in this amazing equipment but they won't allow their operators to really tweak the settings i don't know why that is maybe they don't do extra training maybe they don't i don't know but if you know how to manipulate the settings to get the, the best results you will get the best results for your clients but that comes down to the knowledge to give you the confidence to be able to do it and mm -hmm. and feeling happy that when you're manipulating those settings you know exactly what's going to happen you're not afraid to do it and you're going to get a really good outcome yeah yeah that's what i would say about the beauty of having a linton system is because imagine if you like buying a car you know your car's going to get you from a to b but uh, it's how you get there and you don't know when you're having uh, laser hair removal clients coming in you want to have a system that can treat a broad uh, spectrum of skin types and be have that flexibility to adjust it and tweak it uh, and that's how you'll get those fantastic results mm -hmm. um, and that's why Linton you have that versatility and flexibility you are able to treat a wide variety of skin types plus some other cars might not get there at all <laughs> <laughs> oh cars <laughs> yeah some other cars might not get there at all yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely i agree with ted you know it's about the journey and if you're even going to get there to the end results that you want so i get people coming in quite often saying i only want laser or i only want ipl because i haven't you know had the results and and then it's about sitting down and kind of get into grips with why they haven't got the results. You know, I, it's, it's very easy to think if someone's come in from another clinic and hadn't got the results that they just have done a rubbish treatment. It may be an all manner of reasons why they haven't had the results. It may be the equipment, it may be the person not feeling confident using it, it may be underlying hormonal reasons that they didn't go into the consultation with them because their consultation was only 20 minutes. So it's very easy for us to think, oh, well, we have a Linton and other clinics don't, don't get good results. But actually, there can be all manner of reasons why people don't get the results. But if you set yourself up with the equipment and the training to get the most out of it, then I, you know, you're on to a winner, basically. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with you, Terry. And the training, is, um, the training is good because I think it's important to know, uh, like something like the uh, masterclass is good. And I don't want to bang on about it because we're, we're here to talk about an introduction rather than a masterclass but it's good to know about the other technologies so that you can be educated when you talk to your customer so if you have an alex and somebody comes in saying well i'm you know i want i want diode or i've heard that nd yag's the best then you really need to know and understand the other technologies even if you don't have them in your business because it's you you need to be that person who um like like you said earlier when we were talking on the phone carry you're the king of that knowledge in, in your business and you need to know much more than consumers out there and of course the consumers now have access to so much um information so um so yeah it's important yeah. to have a, a good understanding and also to understand that they're all good they all can achieve 95 percent plus hair removal they all can it's just a case of good quality piece of equipment good supplier and training as we say lots of training Absolutely. but and then, and so if you've if you've ticked you've got the products that you want that you're looking at on that short list you know that they're good quality from a good supplier and that you're going to get good training then it comes down then to what are the other factors in my business about like you know do i need something that's super fast do i need something that can not only do hair removal but that could do skin rejuvenation do I need something small that I can move between rooms? Um, you know, do I want this sort of technology because I know that my biggest competitor has got this sort of technology? So all those sorts of questions, they're the sorts of things that, you know, your, your equ potential equipment supplier should go through with you, really question you, understand your business, what your business goals and needs are, and then help to point you in the right direction as to which technology might be suitable. Um, so Kerry and Ted, you're both using IPL and ND YAG. So we'll come on now to IPL to talk about this a little bit more, um, but then mainly focus on pulsing and the, the way that pulsing really impacts the results that you can achieve. Um, okay, so an IPL is slightly different. So if I just quickly was back to this slide here. Okay, so I'm brushed over this, I apologize. So the IPL is different to a laser because it's not just one wavelength, it's not one color of light. 
it's what we call a broadband source of light. So when you press the button and you emit the light from an IPL, you're actually getting wavelengths anywhere typically from say 600 up to just over a thousand nanometers. So you're getting lots of different colors rather than one specific color. And there are advantages and disadvantages of that. Some of the disadvantages of that are that um, unlike say for example, Alexandrite, you're not getting 100% 755 light. Um, which therefore might not be in some cases as effective as uh, doing so, just using one colour of light. But the disadvantage, uh, sorry, the advantage is that because you're using a variety of different colours of light, IPLs can very effectively treat other things in the skin. So vascular lesions, pigmented lesions, uh, skin rejuvenation, uh, acne, so that broadband source of light gives you a very, very versatile piece of equipment. But there's something you have to do with an IPL to make it really effective. And that is to have lots of variability over the pulse duration. And this is where we find a lot of IPL systems fall down. They have very rigid um, control over pulsing. So why does pulsing matter? Pulsing matters because what you're trying to do is not just heat the hair, but you're trying to uh, customize that heating based on the thermal relaxation time of the target. So if the target is the hair, the thermal relaxation time is the time taken for an object to cool down by half the original temperature. So if you heat it to 100 degrees C, how long does it ta take to get back down to 50 degrees C? And that's your thermal relaxation time. Now, basically, things will heat up more, some things will heat up more quickly than others. So the way that you try to destroy them means you also need to look at how you heat it. Do you heat it quickly? Do you heat it slowly? And this is about maximizing the result that you get. So using exactly the same energy, but over a different pulse duration, so essentially the time of the pulse of that light will affect the result. So if you look at the first box here, where you have um, power and time, and the second box here, where you also have power and time, you can see two quite different um, ways in which energy is delivered to the skin, but with the same fluence. So the shorter pulse durations result in a much higher peak power. And Kerry, I think at this time it would be good to uh, discuss your analogy of beaches and palm trees. I think that's yeah. quite a good way of explaining this. So, yeah, the way I explain about absorption in the skin, um, uh, sorry, in the hair, is that you... What we, the technical term for what we do, and I know obviously a lot of people listening in today already know this, is selective photothermolysis. So we want to selectively heat the target but protect the skin. So it's a constant balance between putting as much energy into the hair but protecting the surrounding tissue. So what we, we do that by delivering that energy um, over several pulses and between those pulses having the delay uh, between each pulse delivery. So to kind of, you know, if, if you say that to a client coming in, they're just going to yawn and get totally bored. But um, so I try and sort of bring an analogy in. And I often say, imagine, imagine a tsunami and there's a bunch of palm trees on a beach. So you have a certain amount of volume of a wave coming towards it. If you draw that back and, in, and shorten it, so in effect, you're shortening pulses and shortening delays, you get a much higher peak of a wave. So the higher the wave, the more devastation on the beach. Whereas if it just all came along in sort of one flow, it might not do that much damage. But by drawing it back, so if you're delivering an energy of say a fluence of 21, you could deliver it over, you know, two pulses um, or four pulses. If you do it over two pulses, then that power of 21 is gonna be like a sort of, if you saw it on a graph, It'd be like a high, you know, sort of a high peak. And so the, sh the more you draw it in with shorter pulses and delays, the higher 
the, the delivery. So if you imagine the palm trees being like the hairs on skin, so if you imagine a tsunami effect, the higher the wave, the more devastation. And that's what we want to create really. So when you get those finer, lighter hairs, like you do when people have been to, you know, other clinics, they haven't had an effective treatment, they're coming into you now with what's left. And obviously because, because treatment always goes for the thicker darker hairs first so they will have had some results you're then left with the weaker finer hairs you need a really good system where you can manipulate those settings to get an effective treatment otherwise it's just not going to work basically mm. good analogy i think that's really useful and that the the, the um the, the the simplistic way of looking at this is a shorter pulse is more aggressive it has higher energy, longer pulses, they are more gentle on the skin. So, um, and you can, and Hayley, you can literally see that. So, those of you who have Illumina and have the normal 650 hand piece, if you set it on a skin type one and flash it, it comes out as a quick, you know, flash. If you set it up to a skin type five, you can literally hear and see the, the pulses. You know, you can, you can hear them almost spitting out five, five micro shots. Mm -hmm. And so when you set it up on that, those, you know, darker skin types that require longer pulses and longer delays, you can actually see that, see that happening. Yeah. So. And yeah, we've just had a question from the audience and um, from Rachel. Hi, Rachel. This is so f finer hairs would need shorter pulses. Absolutely. OK, so when you're looking at the hair that you want to treat, if you've got um, and you've, you've sort of reached an energy level, whether you're using your laser or you're using an IPL, you've reached an energy level where you feel like maybe your, your settings in the manual tell you not to go above that energy level, that fluence for a particular skin type. What else can you do? Shorten the pulse. OK, maybe reach the point where you're not getting a result on that finer hair. This is where pulse duration really matters. So so. You know, it, in, in general, thick, dark hairs on light coloured skins respond pretty well to most things. What really makes um, a laser or an IPL effective, what gives you the power to be able to say, I am going to get you a better result than the clinic down the road, is that ability to tweak and, and customise it with the difficult skins and the difficult hairs so when you've got really fine thin hairs that don't have a lot of melanin in they're more tricky when you've got um, darker skins with fine hair that's more tricky um, and so this idea of the pulse is all about customizing it for the more difficult you know uh, skin and hair that's types that you want. this time of year now clients come in i mean we've had some lovely weather and they say, no, we haven't been in the sun. But when, you, when they come in, you can clearly see, mm -hmm. when you see them last, uh, that they develop a bit of a tan. So that's where this uh, pulse variation really comes into its play for me, because I can adjust the pulse delay and to according to that skin type. And that's where it gives the flexibility, um, because you can adjust it, because they might say, oh, they haven't got a tan. Um, you, you want that flexibility to adjust it when you notice that the skin tone has changed. Yeah. We would always like them to wait there four weeks if they've, you know, changed colour dramatically. Um, but I think that the um, improvement in technology over the last few years has allowed us to be bolder when treating people during the summer months um, and being able to assess whether they are tanned or whether they simply have some bronzing in the skin and being able to then manipulate the treatment that you do for skins um, and and some of that is um, really really flexible so you can um, start to alter not just your pulses but you can start to alter the number of pulses in a pulse train within certain IPL systems so um, for IPL users out there you might be familiar with putting in two pulses, three pulses, something like this, you may have control, you may not, some of them are fixed. But what we do with an IPL pulse train is we typically de deliver the light rather than in just one pulse, like you often do with a laser, you, you deliver it over a series of pulses with what, with what we call pulse delays in the train. 
So the fluence will be the same, say 20 joules, but we'll deliver that over two pulses, three pulses, four pulses, five pulses sometimes. And that gives the skin just a little bit of time to cool down. So this is where we might get someone where um, we may be a little bit concerned about um, some heating of the skin. Um, maybe you're, um, you're, you're, you know, you're uh, moving from one area to another. You're not sure if it is looking a little bit darker, if you have a darker skin and you want a more gentle treatment. This is where we can start to really manipulate our pulse train. So you can um, apply pulses onto the skin and what happens is on your first pulse, then you will get some heating of the hair. So you can see that little red mark there within the hair shaft, that's just heating the hair. And then we'll stop for a moment. The heat will escape from the skin, but the hair will retain it. And that's because there's a difference between the cool down time of skin and hair. The hair holds onto the heat a little bit better than the skin does. So as the skin's cooling, but the hair retains some of the heat and you then put another application of light on, so that's another pulse within your pulse train, then everything gets heated up again. But the hair, because it retained that heat in the original pulse, will just get a little bit hotter. Whereas the skin, with another delay, will be allowed to cool. We deliver then yet another pulse of light, the hair gets even hotter and the epidermis is allowed to cool down again. So we've got the epidermis now below a damage threshold. So the skin has been cooling down in between all of these pulses that we've been delivering. So we're really protecting the epidermis, but the hair has got nice and hot. The hair is, the, the heat has surrounded out into the surrounding follicle. We've damaged the stem cells that cause the hair growth and we can get some really effective hair removal. So if you look at these two pulse trains, so this is like a typical two pulses um, and you've got option A or option B and you look at the delay time in between them, obviously B has a bigger delay. So imagine you put one pulse of light in, you heat up the skin and the hair, you give it a little bit of time to cool and then you heat it again. That's option A. Option B, you heat up the hair, you give it a bit of a longer time to cool. Skin's getting colder a lot faster than the hair is. Then you put another shot of light in. Which is more aggressive, A or B? Which is gonna heat your hair more effectively, A or B? The one with the long cooling time or the one with the short cooling time? Have a little think about that. Drop your answers into the chat. Which one's more also, aggressive, is it A it's or is it B? Worth mentioning Haley, just reminding people that we're talking milliseconds so you know I mean you can actually if you set it to a skin type 5 on your 650 you can you can see those five pulses yeah. um, or hear them even as well um, but we are talking milliseconds but it's amazing what difference that makes even though it's milliseconds between setting it up for a skin type 1 or 2 and a 5 and that is that's really what makes the difference. We have got a few questions um, uh, as well about pulses and delays, but let me know when, when you no, want. Far to away. Yep. So everyone, um, everyone's right. A will be more aggressive. So um, Rachel here says that she has an IPL stroke RF um, that does the settings automatically by inputting hair type Fitzpatrick. I'd like to learn what the professional settings are like. So basically she's asking if she can do learn what the settings should be and would they be covered in your course i mean yes but the only thing is is your your insurance rates will be governed by your clinical protocols which will be given or hopefully given to you by whoever your machine is from some companies i think are just a bit lazy um, and they don't actually give you everything that's required to enable you to get the most out of the machine and if that isn't documented by the company that you're getting the machine from if they're not supplying you with really good medical protocols um, then you're not really going to be able to go outside of those because you won't be covered by insurance um, so I would say go back and see what your protocols say in terms of manipulating the settings and really they should be the ones saying to you how you can get the most out of your machine. And if they're not, then you could go on a course. Um, Linton's course is brilliant, but again, it will be governed by your insurance about whether you're allowed to do that. 
yeah I hope that answers that question um in the back Shashi has asked about the would would you do option b for a higher fitzpatrick um, yeah that would use a 650 handpiece and and that's what will give you that longer delay in between the pulses to allow that skin to calm down and to to cover before you fire the next shot and it's really i've worked with it on skin types four to five and uh, you do get good results with that uh, handpiece because you've got the flexibility of the pulse duration mm. and then it does also come down to uh, you know how confident you are at skin typing because um, skin, you know, you, you, you really need to be very confident about skin, skin typing on the Fitzpatrick scale because um, sometimes if you get your skin typing wrong, you might get away with it. But if you skin type someone as a five when they're a six and you use an IPL on a skin type six, it will 100% result in, a, in quite a severe laser burn. Mm. So it's about being spending that time as well during the consultation about really really spending that time with the client and being confident that you skin type them correctly um i remember i was at a clinic in london where i was training and luckily it was one of the girls that worked for them and she was a hundred percent a skin type five she was mixed race and you know various other bits and pieces um and she they typed her as a four and had used four pulses 40 millisecond delay and she'd got it wasn't a terrible burn but it was definitely you know a bit of a burn mm. so um so yeah so it, it it's really especially with the darker skin types when you're trying to decide between which system to use whether you're going to use an ipl or an MD YAG. so always err on the side of caution if you're not sure if you think god they could be a three or they could be a four and sometimes people do you know they don't not everyone fits in an exact pigeonhole they're not exactly a two or exactly a three always err on the side of caution and go up a skin type because when you're going increasing the skin type so you're going to a darker skin type you're using less energy longer pulses longer delays so it's much safer and then if you think actually I'm, i may have done that incorrectly and i need to get you know slightly better results now you could always patch test on slightly more aggressive settings yeah. but always there on the side of caution and go upper skin type if you're not sure mm. and especially with skin types two to uh, three because if it's the winter when laser hair removal is popular they won't have a tan but in the summer they could tan quite easily especially the europeans and so you've got to be careful to know that it might look pale in the winter but come the summer they've only got to go in the sun for a short while and they'll tan so assessing the skin type is very important yeah absolutely it, and it, there's a lot there's a, there's a there's probably a good 45 minute session on that really isn't there just assess, assessing the tips the skin types properly um which will be covered in the masterclass next week um and there's some really useful resources uh, online as well so um yeah i do think that that's a really important factor in the consultation i mean the consultation that's another webinar in itself isn't it just making sure that we've we've got the right the right people and we're, we're going to treat them in the right way and um, ju just finishing on uh ipls and pulses etc um one piece of advice I would give to people is if you are looking for IPLs, then do look for ones that give you the flexibility to change the number of pulses, the pulse um, delays and the pulse delays, because um, we have the ability at Linton to be able to deliver anything between one and five pulses. So five pulses and then also being able to deliver the delay time in between those pulses makes for an incredibly safe IPL to use on darker skins. But the fact that we can then also deliver just two pulses with really short pulse on times. I mean, we're, we're incredibly unique at Linton in, in the um, how short we can actually get our pulse on times. Um, then that gives you a great flexibility with a lighter skin, a darker skin, a thin hair, a thick hair. It's all about that flexibility. So if you are looking to invest in IPLs, just make sure that you've got something that has got that flexibility, that you've got loads of um, individual choices to make. Um, and then, yeah, block size, uh, Andrea's just mentioned, is important as well. So we have with our uh, IPL systems, we have a... Um, a variety of different applicators so you can use something really small like this 
to treat very small areas, lips, tops of ears for guys, we often get requests for, and then larger blocks as well to treat larger areas. So another good thing to, to bring. Um, Heidi's just said she can't get insurance for skin types five or six and doesn't understand why she has Illumina. Have you got the AQS, Heidi? I'm assuming you have the AG on that, not just the IPLs then. If you could just let us know. Basically, yeah. you, if you've only got the IPL, then you should definitely be able to get insurance for up to skin type five. Uh, it depends to your insurances. Um, so, uh, but skin type six, you would have to have the AQS, you'd have to have the YAG on there to be able to treat. Uh, but the insurance should really go by the medical protocols that you can supply from obviously Linton in this case. Mm -hmm. So you should definitely be able to, to get that, but you'd only be able to get a six if you had the YAG. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. got everything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can always message us at the end and we can tell you about insurance companies. Uh, yeah, boom. they differ from one to the other. You know, um, there's some insurance companies that uh, are extremely strict and some that are not. So it really does vary. So, yeah, yeah. it could be worth looking into to the different insurance options. So, um, Ted, if I can come to you then, um, let's talk about average numbers of treatments for hair removal. What, what do you recommend for body areas? Body areas, I would say six to eight uh, treatments. Um, it does depend on the skin type that we just talked about. And um, for the face, uh, a little bit more because the face can be a little bit tricky because if there's been there's underlying causes for hair growth, hormonal or anything, um, so there's underlying driver for for hair growth. So they can vary. Um, so yeah, I would say six to eight on average. And how? Um, I don't know if you you're able to answer this, but what? Do you get a very large percentage of your customers who have hormonal problems? Is, is it just 10% of your audience? Is it 20, 30? I would say it's a good proportion uh, of when we do uh, facial hair removal for women and it's mainly uh, hormonal growth, polycystic ovaries. We have hair growth where there's transgender uh, clients. So there's a number of reasons that they come to us for, for hair removal. Um, so yeah, so and, and the treatment can vary. I've forgotten the question. I'm getting nervous on you. <laughs> so Ted, do you you're you're doing electrolysis as well? Yes. What we do is a client can come in, and obviously we will assess their uh, skin type and hair type, and we'll put a package together that's best suitable to their hair and skin type. So we might start them on with laser. Get if there's dark hair, start them off with laser and uh, get rid of the majority of the hair and then there might be some grey hairs there so we finish them off with uh, electrolysis so it's a combination of systems that in order to give the best service to the customer you need to tailor that system um, package treatment for, for that individual and that's what what we do. I, I think it's um it's probably a bit of a dying art I guess electrolysis but a, definitely an art I remember doing electrolysis 20 years ago and uh, I did about three or four lessons and decided it wasn't for me. I didn't have the patience for it. <laughs> I wonder, yeah. has anything like um, evolved in the world of electrolysis recently? You know, is it still the case that you would, you, you do have to individually treat each hair and you have to insert the needle and is, is there anything new and exciting? Um, we've got three electrolysis machines, uh, two Sterex and one Apolis. And um, when there's just like a few um, hairs that the laser has got rid of the dark hairs and a few might be odd gray hairs because it's hormonal driven, the older women that have the gray hairs. So we just do them with electrolysis, the Cerex. But where the Apolis comes in is mainly for our transgender clients. They will have an hours of electrolysis quite regularly each week. And we, um, and it, it calms the skin down uh, quite nicely afterwards. It doesn't over treat. So what the Apolis is, is able to do is deliver a, a current very fast. So it's literally in, out, in, out. Um, and, and it allows that area of skin to calm down. And mm. um, going back to what you said earlier, um, Kerry's analysis of the way, what the way I explain it to clients is, You've got to remember the hair is part of the skin and we want to heat up that hair in order to get the best treatment for, for that individual. But we can only go as far as what, that, what the skin will allow us to do. So if the skin is a good condition, it's well hydrated and it's, it's got a good barrier, um, then any impurities will be minimised. But 
skincare does come into it. People just think, all right, I'm coming for hair. I don't need to do anything with skin. Um, but skin maintenance is, is part of hair removal as well. We try and put the two together. So the better the skin, the better the treatment results you get, the minimum downtime you'll have because we need that skin to calm down quickly afterwards. And this is an interesting factor when you look at then transgender, isn't it? Because um, I would imagine that this is an increasingly requested treatment at the moment. Are you seeing an increase, Kerry, in your customers asking for um, male hair removal on the beard area as they're transgender? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we have quite a lot of um, guys who come in for hair removal anyway, even if they're not, not transgender. And interestingly, a lot of facial hair on men um, who, you know, want that sort of perfect chiselled sort of beard uh, look. So not even necessarily transgender, but yes, I have treated quite a few transgender clients over the years and um, they get, once they're on a proper transgender programme, they uh, get eight free treatments funded by the NHS. So as a clinic, so we, I went through a process of registering and became a recognized provider by the NHS to treat transgender clients. So I have treated, uh, interestingly, they get paid for eight treatments on the face, not actually in the gentle area where they're gonna be having the op. So, um, but it, it is the face that really bothers them the most. So quite often um, we get people coming in who are, are just on the program. They have to live as women for at least two years before they're given the op. Now that may vary around the country, but it, it is like that down here. Um, so they absolutely, you know, they want to get rid of the hair on, on their face uh, before they even think about anything else. Mm. Um, so yeah, and, and it works brilliantly. Eight treatments is absolutely not enough uh, to get rid of hair on, on the, even when they're on, you know, female hormones, um, it still, it, it takes more than eight treatments. And so they end up pretty much self-funding themselves. But we've had amazing results. I mean, the 650 Advanced handpiece is absolutely fantastic. Um, it is easily as good as an Alex uh, laser. In fact, I think one of your uh, clients, I think Sam said in one of the webinars recently that one of your clients up north, was it some hospital or somewhere, said that yeah, it was Glasgow, actually Glasgow Royal. better. Yeah, Glasgow Royal Infirmary. They um, they they had they did a clinical trial for us of our 650 advanced handpiece and an Alexandrite, and um, they obviously you know did a full full uh, clinical study for it, and they came yeah. back saying that the Alexandrite just just um, got a slightly higher percentage of hair reduction, but yeah. there were some clients where the 650 was actually. Um, better than the Alex so yeah. the, the sort of overall was it's much of a muchness which I think would surprise a lot of people I think a lot of people will be saying oh an IPL could never be as good as an Alex but th this is a very very tailored uh, IPL hand piece it's not the standard IPL hand piece it's a, a specific hand piece on alumina which is designed to deliver sub millisecond pulses so the pulse um, duration is like super short with a really high fluence and um, so it's designed to mimic Alexandrite uh, and yeah we whoever has that handpiece in this country absolutely raves about it so you know, it, it, it's the, yeah I, I, is the handpiece I use the most and um, and it's very popular it's what I use on most of my clients uh, skin type one to three and um, it gets excellent results. It's my most used hand piece. Mm. It's also got a very, so if you're holding it, you know, the button down, so constantly engaging it, it's got a very fast rep rate. And I remember I had, normally, you know, for lower legs, I allow sort of a half an hour treatment just to get them on and off the couch, etc. And I remember a lady arrived 20 minutes late into a half hour appointment for lower legs. And when I printed it out at the end for the Lumina, I'd done the whole lower legs in seven minutes. So I know I can do it in that time. I'd rather not, but you know, it's like <laughs> pretty stressful seven minutes. Yeah, really, yeah exactly. So, uh, but it's absolutely fantastic, and that's one of the reasons that you know, if 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 someone comes in and they're definitely a skin type four, it's kind of like, oh, I'm going to have to use a six fifty. And although it's absolutely fantastic, I just I love the six 
tactics with Advance because I know I can get those better results and do it in a, in a much quicker session. I was just going to go back to the electrolysis thing. We've had a few questions about that as well. Yeah, yeah. I used to do electrolysis, not me personally, but the girl who worked for me. And initially, like Tedge, we were offering it to do the full service. And it was really annoying having those few hairs left that you couldn't treat for either white or, or gray hairs. Um, and it started off like that. And then in the end, we were just getting people coming in for electrolysis. And it was getting to the point we were so fully booked uh, generally. And a lot of that was being taken up by electrolysis clients that we weren't able to fit in our laser clients who bought packages. And so we don't actually do electrolysis anymore because we got really busy. And at the end of the day, we are a laser clinic. Not So I think the best advice I can give a clinic out there is to try and decide. It's really great if you're starting out and obviously, the more you offer, the more the busier you're going to be. But just bear in mind that people do only need electrolysis sometimes, and it may end up impinging on the clinic time you have for laser. And obviously, it's a much lower earner as well for the time you spend doing it. So, and if you have several rooms and several practitioners, it could work brilliantly. But just bear that in mind because we actually had to, to stop offering it in the end. Someone's also said, um, There's a question for you, Ted. Yeah if you use it or was it just for the gray hairs at the end of treatment no uh, yeah i use it for i mean i use it for gray hairs mainly but then there's some clients that come in that they say it looks like dark hair but it's actually ginger hair mm. and that's where you know sometimes it's not always easy to tell is it dark hair or is it ginger hair because it's like borderline and if i find that i'm not getting the results from uh, the laser not because of the machine or the system because the the hair there's more keratin in the hair than melanin um then i'll revert them to electrolysis and that's how i know i'll get good clearance then so it's about getting the complete package for the for the customer and do you um in terms of uh, people who are not getting results should, should we have that conversation because it can happen can't it you can get people that i mean we we give these i'll just always back to this we we give these as the sort of typical numbers of treatments that people might need and the, and the spacing for them but what happens when you get someone that comes back after three four sessions and says that they can't see any different how do you handle that talk talk us through um Tej, Tej, what you would do there if you had someone that after three or four sessions just hadn't got a result at all when i do my when the client comes in i do a consultation i always give them that they, they are looking for three indicators that the treatment is working effectively the first one that when the hairs grow back they grow back softer secondly they they take longer to grow back and then they don't grow back at all if we're not seeing those three indicators as we're progressing through their treatment then we need to review and assess the, the treatment. So then I will start looking about uh, the underlying cause of the hair growth, uh, the treatment setting, the parameters, the pulse and duration of the setting of the machines, and, and delve in a bit deeper because um, there always is something, there's a reason why. Um, you know, this is where a detailed consultation comes into play, and, and that's where the, with the machine, we've got to be able to tweak it. And that's where, if it is keratin uh, and not melanin in the hair, that's where electrolysis comes in. How about yourself, Kerry? Is there anything you do differently um, if somebody comes in and they... Yeah, so first and foremost, I, I always take photographs of every single mm -hmm. client. So before I even patch test them, I will take a photo. And I actually won't go ahead with treatment unless they're happy to have photos done, but that's for a whole other reasons that we could probably do another webinar. <laughs> so, um, but yes, I always take photographs. Um, I always let them know that sometimes it will feel like the hair's going, you know, during the course, sometimes it will feel like a bit more is coming back. So they're kind of a bit prepped for that anyway. But also with with Linton, I mean, if you, if you use the Linton paperwork, um, I, I, I never get down to treatment four or five and they've not noticed results because every single time they're coming in we're saying you know have you seen a reduction we're recording that mm. so if they come back after their first treatment and say i haven't seen any 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 difference one i always say to them they will either notice a big difference after treatment one and if they do not so much after treatment two and vice versa so i record that and quite often you know people will say oh i haven't seen any difference but you look back at the notes and you're like well actually treatment one you notice the difference treatment two you notice the difference and obviously you don't say it quite like that <laughs> but you know you're kind of jogging their memory to say well remember you know you notice and then you know 
and and also very very occasionally people will say I haven't seen a difference I think it's all come back so I say okay fine let's get you in leave the hair to grow for a week don't touch it let's take some photographs and that's why photos are so important Mm -hmm. because they're looking at it all the time they're not trying to pull a fast one they genuinely are concerned because they're spending this money they haven't seen the results I have to say this is very rare though Mm. but when they see their photographs they're like oh okay yeah no that is a huge difference but they are genuinely not noticing it as much Mm. because they're looking at it every day so that's why it's really good and and it's really great because then they leave the clinic thinking oh brilliant I spent this money but actually I have been getting the results and Mm. I can see that from the photo so the photographs are brilliant because they're very reassuring to the client but also it's for you I mean I can't remember exactly you know the density of hair on someone's bikini line versus another you know you treat people all day long it's as much for you as it is for the client so um so yeah so I I've not I've never had anyone who hasn't had good results very occasionally if you get people who have you know underlying hormonal factors but then again that comes in the consultation if they're polycystic ovarian syndrome for example you have to remind people that this might end up being a hair management system not a permanent solution also that they will require uh, top-ups uh, in the future some people might come after six months some people might be six years um, and that everyone takes a different amount of time also I've found as well that sometimes and again I warn people about this so they're not a bit freaked out if it happens if it happens it tends to happen after around treatment four it can sometimes synchronize the hair growth so it feels like you're getting a bit of a growth spurt after treatment four mm. and I always say to people if that happens because they'll say oh it was going it was going it was going oh god you know now it feels like there's loads of hair on my bikini line and I often say if that happens if there is some kind of synchronization of the hair then the next treatment is like a big whammy you see a massive difference because a lot of the hairs that have come back are in anagen phase and so that's when you see so it's about kind of spending that time initially with them too and also reminding them as you go along because I mean our consultations are an hour and it's a lot of information to get across how much um, do you charge for the consult Kerry I don't charge for consultations, consultation. So the consultation is free of charge. Um, so I do take, um, so for the, the consultation is free. I actually take a 30 pound deposit for the uh, patch test. There's no obligation to go ahead with the patch test on the day, but you know, they all do. And then that is fully refundable upon treatment. But if they choose not to come back for any reason, then it's not refundable. And that's kind of a nice balance between, you know, doing a free consultation, uh, but also not using your laser if these people are not. And some people do genuinely just want to come in, find out more about it. You know, it's your chance to show how much you know, demonstrate your knowledge, you know, use all the, all your um, tools from, you know, your master classes or wherever you've had your training from, um, make them feel confident that you are absolutely the person where they want to have treatment with not make them feel like they have to go ahead that day let them go go away have a think about it and you know they they'll come back um and also by doing that that also comes into what we call informed consent as well so sometimes when people go away and come back um it is part of that in informed consent as opposed to just consent which again we could probably do another whole sort of webinar on but um but yeah what was your question Hayley? I've kind of drifted, <laughs> drifted off so. right. we have oh. a, um, someone's just actually asking you uh, about the we'll come on to skin reactions in a moment but um Rachel just asked about whether you do still fo- photograph bikini area so she's photographing yeah. all the other areas but is, is a bit concerned about photographing bikini I guess so oh. Honestly, Rachel, I, I, you, obviously you have to do what, what you're comfortable with, um, but I absolutely photograph the area and there's ways of doing that. So for example, even if you're photographing the labia, so the lip area, you can get, you know, like a paper towel, put it in under the pants, get them to hold it across. It's really important, especially for the, the lip area on the bikini to know, you know, how much of hair reduction has occurred because quite often with ladies you know the skin color can change it can get much darker on the labia and so obviously the competition of of target of color is there as well so you're going to have to adjust mm. your settings you need to be able to remember and my memory is terrible so i'm never going to remember exactly how dense it was but but yeah i absolutely it's only very very occasionally where people have said 
And also you have to reassure them this is just for us. It's not going to suddenly appear as a before and after photo. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Jane was here um, mm -hmm. on your website. So, um, but I very, I think only once a lady refused to have, and she was kind of a bit of a difficult, you mm -hmm. just knew that, you know, she was going to be a bit of a difficult client and she refused photos. The reason I don't do any treatments without photographs is because if anything was to happen, you need to know what the skin was like before you even touched it for a patch test. And I had years ago a guy who came in to have some treatment under his chin here. And he rang me up a few days later and said, oh, I've, I've had a scar from the laser. I was like, oh, really? I said, I went through, did you have this, did you have that? No, 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 nothing. But there's a white line. And I was thinking, well you wouldn't get hypopigmentation unless you had a burn, unless, you know, and he hadn't had any burning or blister or anything. So looked at his photos and the white line was there beforehand and it was a shaving cut. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't trying to pull a fast one. He was genuinely, he'd never looked at it because I'd patch tested there. He was kind of, you know, looking at it with a mirror. And he was like, oh my God, yeah, of course, sorry. And I was like, no, that's fine. That, you know, that's why we take photographs. It's no, mm -hmm. no problem. But, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily remembered. So that's why it's really important to, to take photos so mm. where do you store these I just wanted to add there that when clients say especially when it's on the face they say oh I haven't had any results and I haven't noticed any difference the other thing to to talk to clients is about they forget if it was they were trimming their chin regularly that they're not trimming it as often they if they were trimming it every other day they were probably trimming it once or twice a week that is still an improvement so the the, the trimming has slowed down yeah. and also so um, when they're not shaving as often and you know yes there might be some soft hairs but it's the gap in between that people don't realize that um because there might be a few soft hairs they're not doing the maintenance that they used to do before mm. so that does make a difference as well because yeah they're not looking in the mirror they've forgotten that oh my god i haven't looked in the mirror there's no hair that is an improvement people don't realize that mm. yeah. and you've, got, you've um you're um you treat a lot of females with facial hair growth, don't you? Yeah. And how do you combat the um, the popular issue of not wanting to shave the area? I'm, I'm quite strict with my clients. I like to have control over what they do at home because part of the, I always say it's a two part process. One, it's to get rid of the hair, which is the part for us, that, which is for us, it's easy we can get rid of the hair, we've got all the system. The second part is often, it's breaking the habit. Often people will look in a magnifying mirror and look, start looking for hairs. Well, I tell people, well, we're not going to win that battle. Yes, if you look in an ordinary mirror, ordinary daylight and you've got hair, yes, we'll get rid of this. But if you're going to go and look in a magnifying mirror, the magnifying mirror is going to do its job, it's going to magnify the hair mm -hmm. and and I'm honest with my clients and I say to you look we're not going to win that battle because you know the magnifying mirror is doing its job but if you look in an ordinary mirror and and you can't see hair that's fine mm -hmm. and, and what is effective hair removal at the end of the day effective hair removal is being able to get up in the morning leave the house without the worry of hair and the longest gap that you don't need to come back to clinic that's effective hair removal the fact that we can't promise you'll never need to have hair removal because if it's a young woman that's coming in she's got a, she might go on the med, uh, the pill medication hormones have children uh, there's perimenopause postmenopause there's lots of stages in life that possibly could encourage the hair growth and plus cystic ovaries but at each stage, if we can get the longest gap that you don't need to come back to clinic and you're not doing anything, and in what I call short-term temporary methods at home, because as we all know, plucking, shaving, threading and waxing will accelerate the hair growth. We don't wax on the face. We, don't, we only wax eyebrows. We don't wax lips. We don't wax chins because it goes against the ethos, what we're trying to do about removing and reducing the hair. So that's what I say to my ladies if they've had a course of laser hair removal and then they all it's all gone the most new fluffy ones i say come back show me let's have a look let's reassess and then we've got other systems that you might okay you might not need the laser but we've got electronics we've got other uh, the mass alkaline mass systems so it's that complete package what i say and i think that one of the things you mentioned there is about if effective results and knowing whether you're getting effective results or not and um this sort of leads us onto this slide and, and for anyone out there who is considering the purchase of any laser or IPL device, I, we always strongly recommend that you have a demonstration so you get the product on site and you should be able to see the device achieve 
one if not more of the following end points when it treats some hair so erythema swollen follicles frazzling of the hair and a little burning hair smell perhaps in the environment as well um, so this is this, this, we just dropped a picture in here of uh, a nice reaction following uh, the treatment with one of our our devices so it's it's usually quite easy to determine uh, if you've got a good piece of equipment or not if you can get it in and you can get you know a demonstration and you can see this um this reaction firsthand so i think we've got quite a few um questions kind of coming in from the audience so sh should we answer those first and then we'll come back to these adverse uh, reactions so mm -hmm. Well, there's quite a few questions just on photos, really. How we're taking the photos, how you're storing the photos. Um, Janet and our team is saying don't don't use mobile phones for taking photos. So, how are you? Um, how are you, Kerry, taking your photos and uh, storing so, them? I I mean, when I first opened, I had a specific camera uh, to take photographs that had a, like an SD card, and it's amazing. Like I think it only had five pixels or something I can't remember what they, but you know but at the end of the day you know iPhones are amazing so we have so the girl um, who works for me has an iPhone it's a clinic phone um, and that basically gets uploaded to uh, Dropbox which has client files in it which are all password protected so they're all stored on the cloud but also you know worst case scenario even if a photo got out there we have a photo like that leg for example it has a label on it that has a client number and the date there's no name it's not identifiable obviously a bit different with tattoos people often feel that they're very identifiable by their sort of mm. tattoos but generally and also when I'm taking pictures of the face I try and obviously unless I'm doing skin rejuvenation if it's chin hair the photo really should be just of that area as clear as possible as well. Uh, we don't need to see the whole face anyway. So ideally only take the photographs of the area that you're treating, don't get the whole face in it, um, and just have somewhere that you keep your client photos, upload it and make sure they're password protected. Okay, great. Yeah, we always get the consent before we take the pictures, so which is on the forms anyway. Yeah, yeah, we do actually have at Linton, we've got a template consent form. So if you're not using that at the moment, then um, you can just uh, drop me an email and I can send you that. Uh, I'll drop my email into the chat here, but we do have a, a consent form for Linton customers to use to, um, to make sure that they're getting their proper consent. Um, just to touch then on adverse reactions, so we talked a little bit about resistance. Um, uh, some studies say that 5 to 10% of the population show resistance to treatment, but we find it's much, much lower than that. We, don't, we certainly don't get 10% of people that don't respond to treatment. Um, typically, like less than 1% will, not, will be non, true non-responders to hair removal. Hayley, I, I always say in our, in our consultations, because I feel that it's the right thing to tell you, I would say that, you know, there is a statistic out there, 5% of people who, for reasons unknown, you know, look like ideal candidates will not respond to treatment. But I always emphasize that that is 5% is a statistic that exists. It's not 5% at Laser Skin Solutions. So, yeah. um, because I've never had anyone who's not responded, even, you know, people with polycystic ovarian syndrome. But I think it's good that you're, showing that you know you are giving people that information because that is again part of informed consent that they've been told everything and they still want to to go ahead so and it shows you're being very, very honest with them as well so and what about adverse reaction then um we, so i can tell you that at linton we track this as less than less than one percent over the course of uh, the last year I looked at was 2018 or something along those lines. So it is very rare to get reactions, but it is a possibility, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I, but I really distinguish between adverse reactions and possible but unwanted reactions. And when I talk yeah. about side effects to clients, I put them into three categories of what is, you know, normal and expected. So swelling, uh, perifollicular edema so you know swelling around the hair follicle reddening of the skin these are all normal mm. then I go into possible but unwanted reactions which is mud burning blistering changes in the skin bruising 
those kind of things. An adverse reaction is a full on laser burn. And really we, sh we shouldn't be having any of those. Obviously with tattoo removal, from, you know, uh, blistering is with red tattoos, they're gonna blister. You have to prepare them for blistering. It's not, you know, so it just depends. But I, I do make a big distinction between an ad a proper adverse reaction um, with, you know, uh, possible but unwanted reactions. And just to remind people that mild burning crusting thing is not necessarily an adverse reaction it is something that you do have to warn people that whilst you know you're not expecting them to get this unless it's tattoo removal that they could be so they're not you know freaking out but obviously a burn a proper burn is a burn and that's an adverse reaction so but really if you're if you if you have the right equipment which where you can have control over the settings you're confident in how to use it you you shouldn't really be getting any adverse reactions really unless someone's lied to you and you know, they've been on a sunbed and haven't told you or you know something like that but really you shouldn't be getting any adverse reactions not with good equipment mm. um ted have you ever had a situation where somebody has got had reactive hair growth so they've actually um i know this is quite rare i'm just interested to know have you seen it where people uh, the hair removal actually the hair growth actually increases after the treatment you ever have I've heard, I have, it hasn't, hasn't happened to me, but I've heard where people, especially with skin types uh, four and five, where they say, because we're heating up one area, say it's on the chin, and we're treating the chin area, and then notice a bit more growth on the neck area because the heat has traveled and stimulated that hair growth. Yeah. Um, I ha I've heard that happen to other people, but I haven't had it happen to me. Yeah. Um, one thing we do do is say, for example, if it's a warm day and, the, and I know I'm treating a skin type four and five, um, I will literally put a cold compress. I don't have the room capacity to have a cooler. So what yeah. we have a cold compress. Mm -hmm. So I'd put a cold compress in that other area just to sort of as a precaution of safety. So no heat travels to an area where I don't want it to go to. Yeah, um, that's what we do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good, good, good advice. I have to say, Haley, I, I've never seen it, and actually, the first time I even particularly heard of reactive hair growth was actually on the level four up with you mm -hmm. guys. Um, so I did my B Tech laser in two thousand and four, so like a billion years ago, and I don't remember that being discussed on that uh course and because i'd never seen it either i'd never had reason to bring it up with you guys but um but it was actually covered in the level four and i remember kirsty saying you know she'd been treating a lady here and suddenly she was getting hair here and i was like really oh my god i've never yeah. <laughs> i've never seen that um so yes yeah, so it is possible but i wouldn't say it's really common is it no no i think if you have um uh devices which are lower in power obviously that will increase the likelihood of that happening um, and it is just a really good idea to make sure that if you are treating facial hair, particularly on the darker skins, that you do cool the other areas around it. That's that's the best piece of advice to, to reduce the chances of that happening. Um, OK, I'll, I might come back to your question in a minute, Katie. I've lost the screen of questions. So I can only just see the three of us. We're going to actually just round up things um, just now because I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We've, we've, we've really got into some nice detailed conversations there and had some really good um, advice from both of you, Kerry and Tej. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just say, Hayley, Tracy's asking, um, yeah. how do we go about booking onto the one day training? I've got staff I would like to send. And also there was a question about how much of the masterclass is covered by the level four. So um, I've actually uh, messaged Sam and she was saying that, that, you know, if you've done the level four quite recently, then the theory part will be covered in the masterclass. But why not come on for half the day so that you can actually be introduced to various different equipment and things like that? So that's something you could email Linton. So would that be clinical at Hayley? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is everybody that's registered for today, I'm going to send you an email after this. I've got your email that you registered for this webinar with, and I can send you the link to just sign up to the hair removal masterclass next week. So you can, you can sign up to that and uh, yeah, we'd love to see you in it. And obviously we'll be able to just go into all of these different things in, in a, in a bit more detail, um, be able to interact with, with Sam and ask more questions and hopefully, yeah, it will be, it's a, 
it is genuinely a really good course to do regardless of what laser you're using or you know which company you're with it's a really in-depth in course if I'll anyone has any if, final questions I'm more than happy just to spend five minutes answering those i was gonna say quickly Haley, that um the good thing about master classes and level four and all those bits and pieces as well is that it really does give you the edge you know even if it's something you can't offer to be able to sit there and say to someone well you need a co2 laser because this is what that would treat you know and also really really knowing your stuff i mean some people won't give two hoots about laser and ipl but years ago i had a guy come in and i i mean i often refer to my ipl as a laser and he went yeah but you keep saying it's a laser but it's not is it it's an ipl and i thought blimey <laughs> you know it's like uh no, you're right. He said, uh, and he said, um, so uh, he goes, do you actually know the difference between a laser and IPL? And I thought, oh God, I said, uh, well, yeah, actually. I said, uh, a laser is a coherent, non-divergent, monochromatic beam and a blah, 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 blah. And he went, and he was like this. I said, why? Are you a physicist? He went, yeah. <laughs> so, so I was like, excellent. Let's talk about lasers because most people are not remotely interested and think it's really boring. But, and we had a really good conversation. And, you know, but if I'd sat there and gone, oh God, actually, now I don't know. That, you know, you can't bluff these things, you know. And my advice is if you don't know the answer, don't ever try. Because if you are faced across a physicist, they will totally see through it. So, yeah. you know, if you're doing laser and you're doing IPL, then absolutely be be the best authority on it in your area so people come to you and hopefully you won't get a physicist who then comes and tests you afterwards. <laughs> I'd highly recommend the Linton core of knowledge. Uh, I've just yeah. recently updated mine after five years and um, honestly it's endorsed with the University of Manchester and it goes through all the theory so it refreshes you and, and that's a good qualification to have when you're having laser training as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it is good. I mean, the core of knowledge will do the physics bit. So like, you know, what's the difference between laser and IPL? We get really into things at an atomic level, you know, really talk about um, what is the scientific difference, but also how does that uh, manifest itself in the way that you use the devices and, you know, the sort of results that you get on the skin and what might be most suitable for you. But it's, it's, it's delivered in a really easy way to understand i mean i look at people like john and sam and i'm just completely you know i would never in a million years be able to kind of like get to that level of physics but the way they deliver the stuff for what we need to know is brilliant and mm. you know and then for like your slightly more geeky clients who really want to know about the science behind it you can absolutely tell them and other people they're not interested yeah. in that's yeah. fine uh, no you don't have to have a linton system in order to do our master class next week it's open to all and it's not focused on linton product it is focused on hair removal knowledge and information um, but of course i am the sales director at linton so forgive me for a few moments as i just tell you about the lasers that we do have um, that offer hair removal uh, and if you're interested I've just dropped my email into the chat here so you can you can drop me a line about any of these but I mentioned earlier that we have four products four devices okay so we have an Exolite which is a fantastic entry-level system for IPL it does hair veins pigment acne and rejuvenation it delivers that sub millisecond pulse two pulses up to five pulses and control over your delays so an excellent introduction to laser uh, to ipl treatments that's the exolite now the lumina is a product which kerry and tedge both have so the lumina then combines that ipl with the 650 advanced handpiece so that's like a, a step up mimicking alexandrite laser in the way that it interacts with the skin and that also then has the ability to add on different lasers and a long pulsed ND YAG laser, a Q switched laser for tattoo removal, a fractional erbium laser for skin resurfacing. So it is a phenomenal piece of equipment that does multiple, multiple treatments. Um, and we talked earlier about not one device being able to do all. If there was one, this would be the one. You know, this is the one which delivers as, as, as as you know as many treatments as you can kind of get onto one platform so the lumina is um we'll do a webinar on the lumina over the next few weeks so tune into that if you're interested 
We also have a diode, so if you want speed, if you want ease of treatment, if you want to be able to treat the bulk of your customers, get fantastic results on them, diode. Diode is great, it's, it's purely hair removal, it doesn't do other things, it's a really focused device uh, and that's the initial really fast treatment times with that one. And then we also have the Motus AY and the Motus AY is the only laser in the world that combines an alexandrite with an ND YAG but also offers a pain-free mode. Now pain-free um, is a subject area where a lot of people are like does it work is it as effective as standard hair removal um, the answer to that question is no your standard hair removal will always be the superior form of hair removal but up until recently no one's had an alex in pain-free mode so think about everything we said about the alex earlier and pain-free mode this is an excellent piece of equipment so we're going to be doing a webinar on this one next week with um, aesthetic medicine as part of their virtual week so if you're interested, then you can tune in to that one. And apologies for the, the last minute sales pitch there, but I had to get that in just to give you an idea as to what we do at Linton. I hope you found the webinar useful. We've got loads of other webinars for you to watch. Um, we, do, we did a webinar recently on an introduction to aesthetic technologies. So this covers Q-switch, it covers um, long pulse, short pulse lasers, it covers um, hair removal, tattoo removal, vascular lesions, pigmented lesions. It's just like a really nice introduction. It's called um, Aesthetic Laser Technologies Explained, a Linton webinar. You'll find it on our website if you would like to view it. We did a great webinar with yourself, Kerry, didn't we recently on rosacea? Um, yeah. That was a brilliant, brilliant webinar. So check that out. Uh, really interesting and um, we've got lots more webinars planned over the next few weeks so sign up to them on our website it's just linton.co.uk and uh, yeah thank you very much um, for